thank you all for, for joining. Um, it's great having you here with us this afternoon, chatting about what is a truly exciting um, product that we have and one of our latest products to our range. And I mean, from what I've seen Andrew put out on Instagram and on the blog and, and so on, it just it looks absolutely phenomenal. And I think after today's presentation, I think a lot of you will get to understanding what makes this product so truly unique. I mean, it's, it's an offering like no other. It, it really does look very special. Yeah, very much so. So I think, you know, being able to um, explore these areas, the trip that we did had a, a heavy conservation focus and was over a, a longer period of time. And um, I think it gave us the perfect opportunity to kind of shape a, a shorter, more intense itinerary, which would still give people the essence of the, uh, the kind of conservation and cultural experience, but with a focus on the photographic side of things. And I think that's where pairing it with the Great Migration, I mean, if you want to photograph a lot of wildebeest, a lot of flamingos, and quite a few predators as well, um, it works out to be a fantastic combination. So I think we're going to go ahead and dive straight into the presentation. And um, I'm going to ask uh, Mike to kick us off uh, with the, the part where we're going to look at what we get up to in the Masai Mara. So Mike, do you want to give us a go here? Sure. I would love to. And the screen you see on um, your computer right now is just a slight holding screen we put together with um, a bit of um, testimonies from guests who joined us on safari before, especially in the Maasai Mara. And if you didn't have enough time to, to read any of that, feel free to go back to that once it's live on YouTube because this recording will get back and put up onto YouTube. So if you miss and you can't sit and watch us throughout this entire presentation, just rest assured and know that you will be able to watch it again later. And please, during this presentation, feel free to keep asking questions as well uh, because we're not going to be seeing the questions pop up but please do feel free to leave any questions you may have right now and then myself and andrew will get back to answering those questions at the end of the presentation now the start of this safari and this experience will lead you and take you into the maasai mara so leaving nairobi kenya and it's a nice short flight about a 45 minute flight into the maasai mara where we will spend our time in what you refer to as either the Mara Conservancy or also known as the Mara Triangle due to the shape of the reserve that we'll find ourselves in. And for the most part, we will spend probably 90 to 95 percent of our time in the triangle. And now the reason for this is because there's good game in the triangle. There's no reason for us to really leave, but also we find ourselves in a prime location along the Mara River. So if you look at your screen, along the right hand side of the frame running up you will see that little blue squiggly line this is the Mara River and now the great thing about it is our camp is based right down at the southern tip of the Mara Triangle very close to the Tanzanian border and it is such a beautiful little spot you're so far away from any other campsite so there's no noise pollution and another great thing about this is that you're in such a prime game viewing area because when that migration moves through, this is usually the first area they pass by. So it really is a great place to, to be hunkered down and spend time on the banks of the Mara River. I think these are, you know, what you're saying there, Mike, is, is absolutely spot on. And, um, you know, the bulk of the, the regularly used crossing points are very close to camp. And, you know, it was just maybe just run through where some of the other camps are located. And sure. one of the, the, the benefits, I think, is, I mean, I don't know how many times you sat there in the afternoons and been the only vehicle left in a sighting when the light is perfect. That is the best. Um, yeah. And it's really great not having to deal with the pressure. So let's just have a look at where some of the other camps and concentration of vehicles are in the Mara. So some of the main crossing points over here, um, down towards Fig Tree, uh, Majichafu area, Lookout Crossing. Um, and then the, uh, the nearest permanent camp is the Serena Lodge up here. What's yeah. that, about 120 beds or so? Yeah, yeah, it's quite a large camp. Um, but the great thing about it is they, they're really far away from us, which is, it's a beautiful thing. And like Andrew had mentioned, you usually out there at first light and if there's action, and there's usually always action along that river, may it be cats moving, may it be herds building up, and also the last bit of action in the afternoons, because all those vehicles, it's quite a long drive to get back to camp, so they need to get back there. So you've got the last, say, what, hour, mm. 45 minutes to an usually, hour, yeah. and it's just the wild eye vehicles, which 
is absolutely bliss. And from, from a photographic perspective, that is golden because you don't have vehicles milling around or driving behind your subject or whatever it may be. So being located where we are is not only good on that front, but also if, say, herds are building and moving back towards the river from our side, from the triangle and wanting to cross back into the main reserve, it's a quick and easy zip to get straight across the Purunga Bridge, which is literally just, what's it, not even a kilometer south yeah. of, of where we are. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really great to be able to access the other side um, of, of the, the Great Amara with ease. And yeah, yeah so it's a, a great spot. I but, love um, that little place. Just, just as a quick one, I know we've got quite a few slides to work through here, but you know, if, if you want to see the migration, there are a couple of things that you can do. You can look at the best time of year to go, and we've got August and September as a traditional peak. Yeah. But then there are a couple of other things that you can do to stack the odds in, the, in your favor, and I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Yes. Um, what would you say are those key ingredients? Creating the experience as a whole, is that what you... Yeah, or giving you the best chance of seeing the migration. Yeah, I think, let me put it down to three words, location, location, location. Spot on, <laughs> yeah. That's, I and mean, to sum it up like that, I mean, and you can see the little wild eye tag on that, that image at the moment. Um, being located in this, this particular area is, it's just, it's absolutely golden because when you have animals, when those herds move out of Tanzania into the, 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 the Mara itself, you have predators that follow these herds as well. Mm. So from a game, uh, game viewing point of view, you, we're in an absolutely prime spot because all these animals will funnel and move past our camp to get to the central or closer to the central triangle or Mara main. Um, so yeah, location, location, location is, I think, the biggest reason for, for our, our success in the, in the Maasai Mara. Now, I think some of the other things would be the flexibility. So, mm -hmm. you know, to have lunch out or to spend an entire day out there and to sit and wait. Um, and exclusivity is another one where, you know, just four guests in a vehicle at a maximum. It gives you space, gives you opportunities to shoot and try different things. But also to, you know, if you want to switch around and spend more time at a crossing, we can easily facilitate that. So Definitely. let's uh, let's dive in a little bit deeper now, shall we? Yes, I think that's a, a good call. So, so the first six nights of this itinerary, that's home. Yeah, it's a pretty special home to have. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I love that place. I, like, I'm heading back there on Saturday, while I fly back up on Saturday to Kenya and then make my way into the Maasai Mara. And like the biggest thing to me about this camp is the location. We're on the, on the banks of the river and the calls you get at night when you're lying in that bed and enjoying a good night's sleep is just what you hear throughout the night. Mm. I think that's what gets me most excited, not only to see our incredible team, who we can also refer to as family, mm. It's good reconnecting with them and just feeling the festivities of, of the, the staff mingling with the guests and vice versa. But lying in, in that tent at night, just you, you can feel where you are, mm. which it's is a, such a special thing. You know, it's, a, it's an authentic tented camp. So you, you get to hear and like you say, you're fully immersed in the sounds and the full experience. Um, three by three meter dome tents uh, accommodated for single people. And this is the other thing is that we don't charge a single supplement in the camp, which is also a, a huge thing. thing for so many people. It's not something you find every day. Um, and yeah, I mean, that the setup in that little camp is beautiful and the shower and if you'll see it pop up on your screen now, but the shower is also one of the highlights of that stay. Yeah. Um, it really is a beautiful part of that camp. You're standing in that shower under the stars and just enjoying a real rustic kind of shower out in the bush. I had a guest who said, um, you know, the, the idea, because these are referred to as bucket showers, and, and in his mind, a bucket shower was, hey, here's your bucket, good <laughs> luck, off you go type thing. So that is not a bucket shower. This is a bucket shower. Um, and it really is. I mean, even if it is drizzling, you know, to have that hot water with a little bit of uh, rainwater coming down as well, it's a fantastic experience. And the beautiful thing about it, it's instant hot water. Like off yeah. the bat. Yeah. It's not like run it for two minutes, wait for the hot water. It's, it's there yeah. and av available at any time, which is awesome. And then the dining area and media tent and lounge area, fantastic additions which have come into play over the last couple of years since we've had a permanent site. Exactly, yeah. Over the past, going on six years now, I have seen this camp develop and change and it really is great additions that we've added to this little special place because Yes, your tent is great, but during the day when you want to chat about the 
the action you had that day or when you want to work in Lightroom or during mealtimes, wherever you find yourself in camp, there's ample space. So yes, there's 12 guests who will join us in camp, but there's more than enough space to still feel as if you are alone out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's just the way this camp is set up is absolutely beautiful. And every one of these areas that you see on the screen, uh, being the dining tent, being the... Um, um, what's it, the light rooming tent, what's that, media, media tent, tent. There, there we go, I was lost for words there, and the, the bar lounging area all have a view of the Mara River, so it's, it's an incredible place to spend time between the two drives if you do come back to camp. Speaking of drives and the experience, um, kind of, you know, these are the vehicles that we use, uh, 4x4 Toyota Land Cruisers with a pop top, and, um, you know, it's really a great, great way to kind of move around the landscape isn't it yes it really is um it really is a, a great way to experience the Maasai Mara and like we'd mentioned some days we are out there for a long period of time um waiting for either a build-up herds to come over or whatever it may be and it's it's such an awesome setup knowing that that vehicle can still provide you with shade um when you are out there in the heat of the day and sometimes it's worth spending those hours out there. I mean, I've sp spent hours, seven, eight hours for moments like this to happen. Yeah. Um, to see these animals run down the banks, cross the Mara River. <clears throat> and if you're not willing to put in the time, it's, yeah, it's very easy to miss really cool moments like this in the Mara. Yeah. And I think our vehicle set up perfectly with the, the fridge inside of it, the snacks available. Um, so, and obviously, as you'd mentioned, our team who can come in and bring either breakfast or lunch to us and just kind of give us a little bowl of food through the window yeah. so that we don't have to move away from those prime spots and locations. So, I mean, let's say six nights, seven days, you know, you, the ideal start, you're three days in, you've had some magnificent crossings and you're looking for a little bit more diversity now in the experience. Is a migration week all about the migration? Definitely not. So there's some more stuff to see? Yeah, there's definitely more than just about a million wildebeest running around in that place. And, and it hasn't been labeled the greatest game reserve in the world for nothing. You know, this, this reserve is home to so many different mammal species, bird species, and the topography, the landscape, everything about this reserve is either a, a photographer or a naturalist or a natural enthusiast's like happy place. Mm. I, mean, I love the diversity that the Masai Mara can provide for, for our guests who join us there. So much so that we often have people booking back-to-back -back weeks and spending extended periods of time out there. Exactly, exactly. We go and look at Mariah Rademacher this year. I think she spent a total of four weeks. Mm. In, <laughs> four weeks in the Masai Mara this year. Yeah, she's got, she's got one or two images to work through, that's, <laughs> that's, that's for, for sure. sure yes. So I know a couple of you guys um, have joined us in the Mara camp, so I'd love for you to just share your quick little testimonial in that chat section. We'll come through to it a little bit later, Yeah. Um, if that's all right. And, um, yeah, so I mean, it, it is, it's about to experience. It's not all about photography. Obviously, the Great Migration Weeks, we have two photographic hosts in camp that will rotate between the vehicles, a total of four vehicles, maximum of 12 guests. Um, and as much as it's about the photography, it's also about the experience. It definitely is. The, like, I always like to say to guests, when you, you'll arrive as a guest, within a matter of minutes, you will be become really good friends within that camp and by the time you leave you will be family and at special moments like these I mean this doesn't really happen often but when you do take that one afternoon a sundowner to, stop in the Mara <laughs> exactly it's like why would you ever do that but I mean some weeks are just so productive this was the first great migration week this year and we had I think 16 crossings in that in that first week yeah and so we just decided let's take an afternoon enjoy a drink and just take in the beauty of what the Masai Mara is at sunset, taking photographs of the sunsets, taking photographs of Dixon and our team who had joined us out there and came and, and served us drinks. And it, it really was something truly special. And it's moments like this where you really take that step back and realize, wow, this place is phenomenal. How it, what it does to people and how they react to everything that goes on in the Masai Mara. It's a it really is a special place and I think the biggest reason for it being such a magical place, I mean, it, it's, it's a, the greatest game reserve in the world, but I think the, what makes us slightly different to any other experience in that reserve 
are the people that that we yeah or that host us and, and look after our camp and our staff and family in East Africa. And it's such a warm, genuine hospitality that you get from, from these guys. And I think one of the big things as well is the cultural aspect of it. And every week we have a cultural element, yes, which is yeah. far more authentic than one could ever hope for in one of these larger, more commercial lodge type environments. It's a yeah. slightly more, not slightly, significantly more intimate experience. Definitely, definitely. I mean, this, this spot right over here, this is the best place in camp. I always label it the best fireplace in Africa and I think a lot of people who have joined us there, a lot of people who sit in this office would definitely agree with me when I say that is the best um, campfire in Africa and where Dixon and our team will just share their, their ways, their culture, their beliefs with all the guests who, who join us in camp and it really is, it's a moving experience. I'll never forget the first time I experienced that and it's it's humbling. And it's not just that one night, it's you know, every morning sitting down there having a cup of coffee, chatting, and um, yeah, it's, it's a very humbling experience and far more authentic than one could ever wish and hope for in, in this kind of setting and environment. Mm. And um, obviously our, our kind of camp uh, leader, the, exactly. the man of the moment, uh, yeah. Dixon, um, and, and the rest of the team are also very comfortable having their images taken. So from that yeah, perspective, Guests are able to sit around the fire and be able to create something quite interesting and unique yes. with the Maasai staff. So ticking a cultural element of the Great Migration and really any visit to Kenya in the Maasai Mara. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So, Mike, maybe just to wrap up for us here, what run mm -hmm. us through the itinerary like on a day to day basis, you know, from day one all the way through to day six, which is where chapter two of this adventure that we're discussing today really then kicks, kicks in. in. Yeah. All right. So how it all works is you will jump onto an international flight into Nairobi, Kenya to Jomo Kenyatta International, where from that point onwards, you'll be transferred to a hotel of choice. We usually recommend um, the Western because for the next morning, your flight out to the Masai Mara is a lot easier logistically sleeping at the Western and it's just across the road. You fly out from Wilson and in the hotel that evening, you will meet whoever your guide is. And on this particular week would either be uh, myself or Andrew and another wild eye guide um, enjoy a meal together, get to know each other, get to know the group who is at the hotel that evening. The next morning you will then depart from Nairobi Wilson Airport and it's a 45 minute flight into the Maasai Mara where you'll then meet our team on the ground there. So our, our drivers, Dixon, um, Jimmy, Sammy, Dixon will be at the airstrip, Ken. And that, that's important because you get in quite early on the day one. Yes. And for you know, guests you who are full departing day. and not joining us for the extension of this trip, you also fly out late in the afternoon. So it's seven full days, six nights and seven full days. In the Maasai Mara, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, day to day, it's, it's literally eat, sleep, safari, repeat, because as you jump in the vehicle at the airstrip, it's safari back to camp. And if there's buildups, uh, wildebeests at the, the edge of the river, you'll stay out there. Lunch can be brought to you, um, whatever the case may be. But yeah, pretty long days out there um, looking or either waiting for buildups, looking at lion, leopard, cheetah, whatever there is. Um, and at times you go back to camp. At times you stay out there and enjoy lunch out in the field. Um, dinners in camp, time around the fire, good night's rest, early morning wake up, Doing and this just repeats, yeah. Um, and then come, come the last day, you'll still enjoy a full morning safari out there and head back to camp. And for those who don't join us into chapter two, chapter two <laughs> will then depart and fly back to Nairobi and then make their way um, back home or to any other extension that they planned with us. Um, within Kenya or other countries surrounding Kenya. So I think this is where it gets interesting for, for those of you who have already joined us on a Great Migration Safari or um, are familiar with that. And you know the second chapter of this is quite unique and very different to anything that we've had in the past. So um, you know we ran a trip up to this area in September this, this year, which is not my first time out there, but at the first time that we'd stayed at Lentore, which is the lodge that we use for this. Um, and the first time that we'd actually been able to get uh, some time 
on scenic aerial flights over the region. So just to kind of put it into perspective, um, the Mara Triangle is up here in this top left hand corner. We then fly across to just next to this section here where it says Kiramatian. And this is the Old Kiramatian and Champali Conservancies, these two sections here. This over here is Lake Magadi, this is Lake Natron, and over here we have Mount Champoli. Now to put it into perspective, if you come all the way down into this bottom corner here, you've got Amboseli. And so what really, why this area is so important is because it acts as a corridor for wildlife to move between the Mara and Amboseli. So you've got those two incredible iconic conservation areas as bookends to the area that we're going to be spending time in over the four nights that we spend um, at Lentori Lodge. And um, just to kind of give you an idea, we certainly won't be slumming it. No, definitely uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> so the lodge itself is built on a bit of a ridge. This is a very hot, dry, arid environment. So being slightly elevated ensures a bit of a cool breeze. And one of the lovely things about this part of the safari, which is quite unusual for any photographic safari, is that you may actually get to spend a little bit of time in your room. Believe it or not, um, <laughs> these rooms are incredible. And this itinerary is very different in the way that it's run. And we'll, we'll touch on that later. But the, the area itself is actually quite fascinating as well because it's an area which supports wildlife, but also a significant population of people. And the Old Kiramatian and Shampali Conservancies are actually owned and managed. They're part of the group ranches. Um, so Maasai people own and manage this land. And it's part of a, a far greater scheme where these people live in harmony with wildlife. So if you, if you look at the, the, the landscape and the, the kind of the area as a whole, you can see that there is a river that runs through this section here. So they have dry season grazing over this side, uh, sorry, wet season grazing over this side, and then dry season grazing over here. So what happens is that they don't utilize the entire land all at the same time. There's patches that they will move into seasonally, which means that there are areas that are free for wildlife and areas that are free to recover whilst there are no cattle there. And mm. even from a human wildlife conflict um, Thing. We, we kind of touched on this when we were there and they spoke about there being no human wildlife conflict, which was strange. And I said, well, how, how come? Possible, well, yeah. lions are killing cattle and goats, but there's no conflict because the way that it was explained is if your cat is killed by my dog, you'll be upset with me, right? Yeah, for sure. Pretty upset. Yeah. But if your cat is killed by your dog, it'll hurt but it doesn't quite have the same sting. Correct. And so the point there is that the people, the communities own the wildlife. And so when there are incidents of predation on livestock, that it doesn't create the same sort of reaction and retaliation that it would in certain areas where it is the government's lions that are killing it or the researchers' lions that are killing livestock. Mm. So it's a fascinating um, kind of landscape and one which I think is very important for the future of conservation in Africa because it, it seeks to show how people can live in harmony with wildlife and I think you know it's, it's proving it's possible it is and yeah. um, it's got a lot to do with the Maasai culture so we will touch on that during our time here um, as well but one of the the key elements of this and the first part of the uh, trip that we mentioned is the hides and helicopters and at Lentori Lodge itself, there is a dedicated photographic hide, which, um, you know, from the lodge, we can walk down into it. It's easily located. You drop down and the hide itself is a lot bigger than one would think. You can see that there's glass windows here. There's a, a setup, um, a bench for photographers to put their gear down. There's an infrared kind of light, which allows um, you to see what's going on inside the hide, but doesn't allow wildlife to see what's, what's happening there. And funny enough, it also has um, space for people to sleep. Um, so on the one side, uh, just behind the container itself, you've got two double beds or two beds and then two more beds inside the actual hide itself. So when we say in the itinerary that we're going to be spending some time in the hide, um, we're going to be spending a significant amount of time at night in this hide. And being such an arid area, um, there's a lot of stuff that will come down to drink at, at night. Night. Yeah. So you may not get to spend the time that you thought you might at your room, which is normally the other way around on a safari. But exactly. in this instance, 
you know, the early hours of the morning, time to relax after a night in the hide, where you can still sleep, but you probably won't get as good a night's sleep. But, you know, being woken for a leopard that's coming to have a drink or a striped hyena that's coming to have a drink, I think is a... It's well worth it. It's a fairly good problem <laughs> to have in the greater scheme of things. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is the kind of hide setup. This is the view from the hide itself. Um, beautiful tree uh, which overhangs there. Um, it's not as big a hide or bigger a water point as one would think. It's actually quite small, which is great because it concentrates the movement of the animals. Yeah. And this is the kind of scene at 35 mils. And so this is your view for the greater part of the night, um, but Beautiful. not much happening. This could be a time lapse as well. Yeah. But all you need is for one subject to pop across the frame. To make it worth it. And so, Jeez. I mean, it, it's, it's quite a sophisticated build that they've got on this hide. I mean, you can control from inside how much water you want. So if you want the water to oh, sit wow. right at the lip and give you that perfect shadow, you can. Wow, wow. Um, and it really has been built for photographers in mind. So the lighting is perfect. The, the, the whole setup is built for photography. Hmm. It is quite different having glass in front of you. You can't hear the sounds. You kind of disconnect it. But it is so, um, it keeps you so removed from the animals. I mean, we had a little genet dancing along the front window and completely oblivious to what's going on, picking up all the insects. Had an um, idea you guys were in there. Absolutely yeah. clueless. That's insane. Um, and I mean, to see a striped hyena, I, I don't know how many times you've seen one. Once, and it was briefly. Yeah. Brief. It's like there and gone. So, so you know, yeah, these, that is awesome. It, it really is. And these were probably the most common of the, the visitors uh, to the water hole, but we also had some things like uh, white-tailed mongoose. Uh, mm. We had a civet come down and drink one evening. Those angles make such a difference. The low angle and just also the behavior, mm. and uh, it, it really is quite quite special to be able to sit and spend time there. So, you know, there's often scrub hairs. Um, and this particular hide often gets leopard coming down because, as I mentioned, the lodge is built on the edge of this ridge and there's a natural spring which runs just behind the lodge. So there's a lot of natural traffic that comes uh, and moves around this waterhole. Um, unfortunately, during our stay there, the one night that there were some other guests in camp and they went down to the waterhole, guess who came for a drink? The leopard, of course. <laughs> um, so on this particular trip, we take exclusive use of the lodge and the photographic hide. So every night we'll be down there. Um, they also will provide us with a spotter um, who sits in the hide and can wake us up. Mm. But generally, that's what I'll be doing. Yeah. Um, and then because we're so close to the lodge, guests can also decide, right, well, you know, it's midnight. I'm going to tap out and, and, and head back sleep. to bed. Yeah. yeah. And so that's where the, the kind of the bulk of the time and in the mornings, mm very relaxed start to the day, sleep in, have a coffee, enjoy the room, have breakfast, work on Lightroom, come down for lunch, which is where we're going to have our cultural and conservation engagements with Sorala, which is the South Rift Landowners Association, and hear about the good work that they're doing. And also from Guy Weston, who is part of Rebuilding the Pride, who does a lot of monitoring of predators in the area. And as part of your uh, contribution or um, a fee for this trip, you will be making donations to both of those organizations. So um, we've shortened it slightly from what we did this year, where we had a couple of days dedicated to visiting and ex exposing our guests to that, to have shorter presentations during lunchtime and then kind of condense the trip into this four night stay. Um, and the next part of the trip, if, as if, you know, this wasn't exciting it's, enough. Yeah, this is um, very special. <laughs> the next part is just as interesting and I think probably one of the most appealing aspects of this trip. Mm. Um, the landscape out here is wild, harsh, rugged and just unbelievably beautiful at the same time. Um, these are just uh, some of the, the kind of slip uh, uh, images from an iPhone, um, you know, taken from the helicopter. Just to give you an idea of the diversity uh, from the soda lakes of Magadi and Lake Natron all the way through to forest areas up on the top of the, um, the hills behind the lodge. It really is quite diverse and to think that you can see all of this um, over a period of, you know, just an hour long scenic flight with a helicopter is, is something else. Um, so it is quite fascinating and the diversity just in those nine images is crazy. Yeah. It, it really is spectacular and it's really pretty out there. You know, from an experience point of view, what, for those of you who perhaps haven't flown and done aerial flights before, uh, we fly in a little Robbie 22, which takes four passengers and typically we remove the doors and both your two guests will be seated in the left hand side of the chopper, the pilot in the right, and then I sit behind the pilot. 
Um, as you saw in some of those images, we get earphones and microphones, we can talk and I will guide you through composition, what to look for, settings. Um, and the reason that both guests are seated on the left hand side of the chopper is that as we find things that we want to photograph, we turn and bank and circle so that they're on that left hand side, we can reposition from there. Okay. So it gives the guests absolute uh, first class chances to photograph from the Getting air. that front row seat. Yeah. Exactly. And just, you know, some of the images that one can expect out of this, and this, is, these sort of things speak to me because I love the more abstract, the abstract less obvious artsy things. kind of things. That is beautiful. Yeah. And so Lake Magadi and Lake Natron are soda lakes, so they've got this very alkaline kind of um, base to them, a lot of salt deposits as water evaporates and you start to get these beautiful colors coming through these pinks and oranges and reds um, and really in terms of you know these abstract kind of shots the opportunities are absolutely endless yeah um, patterns mm -hmm. and textures I mean the scale of the place is just unbelievable I can only imagine and I mean the stories they tell it's kind of like where life and death meet in a sense with water evaporating and it looks like this dead arid dry lake with that in that one of the previous images that lush vegetation growing around the sides um, so i think yeah really deep and beautiful storytelling that you can create for yourself through your photographs and i mean the things as i've mentioned i've seen you post online is just absolutely mind-blowing yeah i mean it it really is something that's quite spectacular to to see and experience and as you say life and death because you know looking at some of these images you'd think that there's absolutely nothing out here how, how can, can anything survive, survive? Yeah. i tell you what does survive out there is flamingos <laughs> um and there are thousands of them feeding in the shallows of these soda lakes and so again, you know, the photographic opportunities of different positions and when you're flying over the helicopter at different heights, um, Beautiful. You, cool. you know, you get so many different opportunities. And so over two of the last afternoons that we are in Lentoria, we do these scenic flights. We've included um, uh, two hours of flying time for, for each of the guests. And the way that we will manage that is that on the afternoon um, of day one, uh, let's say group one will fly between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, group two will fly between five and six. The next day we alternate and group two flies first between four and five and five and six. So everyone so get gets the best light. Different time, yeah. And, you know, slightly different to my experience in the Okavango Delta, where you want to be up early in the morning, first light, long shadows, great light. This area is more late afternoon because of the heat and you've had these little convection whirlwinds and currents developing over the pans which give you those patterns in the water and typically it clears up a little bit more in the afternoon. So the yeah. afternoon light is nice and rich. You get deep shadows as well when flamingos are flying. Fantastic time. So each of the guests will get to fly um, for two hours over two days which gives us an opportunity to sit and review images after the first one and work out what worked, what didn't work. Mm. Um, and I'll obviously also be doing a presentation to the guests on aerial photography before the first flights, just running through settings behind these images, for example, what to look for, patterns, textures, that sort of thing. Yeah. But it's not just the flamingos that are out there as well. There's also a hell of a lot of wildlife. Um, so, you know, one of the questions might be, well, why don't we do game drives out here? The wildlife is, is there. It's just sparse, you drive for long distances, and most of the predators are mainly active at night. So of course. the time that we will spend in the hide, and then having to do game drives, and then helicopters. This you won't is, be sleeping. You know what? <laughs> the way to put it is it's the perfect way to just kind of decompress after a week of chaos in, in the, the Great Mario. Migration. I was about to say that. <laughs> Sleep in, have a coffee, do some light rooming. Uh, kind of work on, on images from the night before from the hide, as well as working through images from the scenic aerial flights as well. So again, just a couple more slides and pictures of things that we would see from the air. Um, what you see here is a little rocky ridge in the northern section of Lake uh, Natron. And in the background, you can see the lake itself and then some goats and desert rose bushes growing up on these things. And again, it just goes to show how people and wildlife live together in this part of the world. Um, this is the one of the open grasslands coming up to Mount Champoli, which is in the background there. And just it's bizarre, like 200 meters away from where we photographed these elephants, um, herders with their cattle and goats, you know, so yeah, it, it really was an absolute privilege to see people and wildlife living and coexisting together. In so harmony, obviously. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that, that pretty much wraps up the four nights there. It is about hides, 
every single night we are in that height. There is also a little bird reflection height mm -hmm. um, for early mornings and helicopters. And we spend the last two days spending an hour. Um, each of the guests will fly for an hour on each of those days getting the kind of shots that we've just kind of worked through now. Yeah. So overall, 10 nights, um, which is great for a lot of people who come into Kenya, six nights, seven days may feel a little bit shorter. So this adds on a little bit and um, gives you a completely different experience at the same time. So Definitely. maybe try and photograph as many flamingos as you had wildebeest on the first portion of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it's, it's the diversity that this, the safari offers is incredible. And from a photographic perspective, it is mind-blowing. I mean, you get, you, you get to experience the greatest phenomenon on Earth being the Great Migration into such a unique photographically set up experience having that eye level hide the helicopter flight but then also from a conservation point of view getting a deeper understanding there's just so much more value add to or there will be so much more value add to you as the guest not only just coming in for the photograph but understanding how these people live their life on the ground here and yeah. i think it's it's vital and it's so important and it's something i try and do on safaris is chat about things like this as well because it's not only about the photographs or the connections and the friendships you make, but it's understanding the environment you're in to then only truly understand and appreciate the area you find yourself in is vital. I mm. think it's very important. And this, this safari is going to, and what we've heard, obviously, from yourself, Andrew, being there earlier this year, provides all of that for you. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's that connection of the, the team, of our staff in the Maasai Mara mm. and going into an area where... Maasai people live and seeing that you will fly over the villages that you know they are live in, in this area and yeah. um, so that night you're photographing leopards and maybe a lion that comes down to drink and then you're flying over people and cattle and you just think well hang on how does this all work so <laughs> it, it really is quite a an amazing experience um, so just to kind of bring it into land guys we've, we've, we've kind of covered the logistics arriving into Nairobi six nights at the Wild Eye Mara camp on the banks of the Mara River with a group of a total of 12 guests. Four of those guests will then continue on with either myself next year or Mike in the following year um, to spend four more nights at Lintoria Lodge where we're going to take exclusive use of the whole camp. Um, during our time in the, the Mara, your package is fully inclusive, uh, all your drinks, conservation fees, your internal flights. And then at Lentori, we've got exclusive use of the, the camp, the photographic hide, as well as two hours of scenic flights for each of the guests. And then just from a logistics perspective, just a, a little finishing touch and finesse to the end of the safari, is we have included a day room at the four points at Jomo Kenyatta International. So we'll fly out early and that's kind of still, as we navigate PCR testing and timings and turnarounds to include that, but a great opportunity to have a bite to eat. I love that restaurant on, on the rooftop there. It's a there. beautiful restaurant there, it's um, amazing. Have a shower and freshen up before a, what is typically a late night Flight, return yeah. for people back to wherever it is or connecting onwards. Yeah, and it's great. It's a not even a five-minute drive from the terminal, so yeah, it, which, it works out really, awesome. really well. Yeah.